uh, if you have anything uh, to ask. Okay, uh, if not, let me, let me briefly recap what we learned last time. So last time we started to learn um, about dielectric waveguide. And waveguide, uh, as we introduced earlier, is just about a structure that allows a wave uh, propagate uh, along it. And you can see here, uh, you know, the, the uh, electromagnetic wave is propagating along this uh, green waveguide. And um, we started looking at a simplest form of optical waveguide, which is a PEC waveguide, perfect electric conductor waveguide. And here we define a few terms. The first one, um, we divide a uh, wave vector into two direction, like one along the propagation direction, which we call as a propagation constant or beta. And then the other is perpendicular direction, which is K perpendicular, okay? And then we actually try to solve this problem uh, by uh, solving the wave equation. And you can see, as you can see, the system is easy. Like we, you have a dielectric slab with permittivity epsilon and thickness 2a. And, uh, and then because we are looking for a mode, uh, what I mean by mode is that, uh, you know, the uh, electromagnetic wave that shares the propagation constant beta. So having the same beta along the uh, propagation direction. So e to the i beta z, the z directional dependence is fixed. And then time dependence, of course, is also fixed. It's about uh, just a, you know, uh, time harmonic oscillation with uh, frequency omega. So all we need to do is actually figuring out what's the x dependence of uh, e field and h field. And here we assume that structure has y directional symmetry and then there's no dependence on E and H field on Y. So how do we do that? Uh, well, because we have electromagnetic wave equation, uh, we, we know uh, what's the general solution of the electric field, right? And the relation between uh, the K vector, like a, a propagation constant and the uh, kappa, which is the uh, surface, perpendicular K vector. And then uh, we also know, because we know the expression for E field uh, by taking curl of it, uh, we know the expression for H field. And for those who are not familiar with how to do this, uh, you probably rem remember curl of E is equal to uh, 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 t t v t t. I'm not sure. Like there was a there was something, some some mu or epsilon above here. But anyway, there is a uh, Maxwell's equation looks like this. And then because all the time dependence is e to the i omega t, e to the minus i omega t. So uh, round round t is equal to uh, minus i omega, right? So uh, basically, this gives you uh, I omega B is equal to curl of E, and then B is mu H. So if you do that, this mu H becomes uh, this equation, right? Oh, there's a minus sign. Oh, probably this was plus. Anyway, that's, that's how it works. And so um, once you know the electric field and magnetic field equation, then all you need to do is actually basically applying the uh, boundary condition at the interface. But because we are dealing with PEC, perfect electric conductor, boundary condition is extremely simple, which is uh, E field is zero, right? So if we want to, if you apply E field is zero, 
Then uh, for the symmetric mode and for the uh, anti-symmetric mode, there are only a few uh, specific kappas are allowed, right? And then depending on uh, the value of kappa here, which is uh, discrete, and then as m, which is an integer, increases, uh, kappa increases, and we call this m as a mode number, okay? And here you're looking at uh, the, the examples like m equals one, which is the fundamental mode, the lowest order mode, which is a cosine mode wave. And then m equals two is uh, uh, fundamental uh, anti-symmetric mode, which is sine wave and m equals three, of course, uh, should look like something like this. m equals four should look like something like that, right? So there are a bunch of modes, but the number of allowed mode uh, is a limited. And then uh, here we, uh, we draw a dispersion relation of a PEC waveguide. And as we, uh, one thing that we can immediately uh, notice is that uh, if this is a light line, then uh, all the waveguide modes are on the, uh, left side of the light line. And then uh, we have a cutoff frequencies. Like let's say if we are at certain frequency, here is our frequency, then uh, we have only one mode allowed, right? And then if we are at higher frequency, we have two modes allowed and so on. So depending on the frequency, uh, the number of allowed modes uh, changes and then uh, the frequency where a, uh, there is a mode uh, disappears, uh, we call this as a mode cutoff. And then uh, a graphical way to understand this mode cutoff is, is just by understanding, uh, just looking at the, uh, the ray propagation. So as you can see, uh, when omega is high, so omega is high frequency, so let's say omega is high, then uh, the free space k vector, which is k0, which is omega divided by c, is large, okay? So free space k vector is large. And then uh, inside the medium, uh, let's say this inside medium, the index was n, then n k0, which is the length of the wave vector, the total wave vector is large, right? When omega is large, omega is high. So in this case, for a fixed transverse k vector, k uh, perpendicular or kappa, for a fixed value, if your uh, uh, total k vector is large, that means your angle of incidence is large, right? So that there's no problem that this wave can propagate. But as your frequency gets lower and lower, which means your total uh, k vector becomes shorter and shorter, then eventually your total k vector becomes uh, uh, like equal to the transverse k vector. And in this case, there's no uh, surface parallel component. So the wave cannot propagate, but just you know going back and forth vertically. So that's the, kind of a ray optic interpretation of uh, uh, cutoff, mode cutoff. Okay, and for TM polarization, I uh, recommend you to solve uh, it by yourself. And as uh, the difference between TE and TM polarization is that in TM, TE polarization, the electric field direction was along Y. And, but for TM polarization, uh, magnetic field is a long Y. So that's the only difference. Like, uh, for, so for TM polarization, the wave equation is exactly the same. And then you can actually try to solve a uh, uh, guided wave solution and then boundary conditions and also get the, uh, get the dispersion relations. So I just recommend you try it by yourself because it's not that difficult. Okay, so now uh, we want to, uh, you know, 
add one more layer uh, to our discussion, which is uh, basically limiting. Uh, uh, so previously, what we've done was a slab. What it, what is called as a slab waveguide. So in this slab waveguide, uh, uh, the wave wave is constrained only along vertical direction, right? It, what we did was PC and then dielectric and PC. So confined only along that this direction. And if uh, the wave is confined along uh, along the uh, width direction too, and then the wave is propagating along this direction, uh, this is called rectangular waveguide, right? And then uh, both confinement, like both constraint gives you a uh, specific only allows you a specific uh, mode number and thus uh, as you can see here if you look at the mode profile the fundamental mode uh, should look like this so you have a basically cosine wave along one direction and cosine wave for the other direction right that's the fundamental mode so mode one one okay and now uh, you have two choices. One is that the mode is cosine along shorter direction, but sine like becomes an uh, um, anti-symmetric sine mode. So M equals two mode along vertical direction. And the other choice is that uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is that? The M, uh, sorry. Uh, cosine along long, longer direction, but sine along shorter direction. So, uh, and because we uh, decided to label this as a, you know, X and Y, so that is X and Y mode number, it becomes one, 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 two, two, one. And of course there are many other variations like one, three, two, 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 three, and, and many others. So here's a quick question, like uh, if you, so you know that uh, K squared is KX squared plus KY squared plus KZ squared, right? That's everyone knows. And then because Z is the propagation direction and we uh, decided to call KZ as beta, right? So beta, is now, well, this K is again uh, NK zero. So, or N squared omega squared divided by C squared. So let's say uh, N squared omega squared C squared minus KX squared minus KY squared. So this is beta, the propagation constant. So if you want to uh, kind of sort this mode based on the length of beta, uh, which one would be longest? Can you type in, like, can you type in as a, uh, you know, uh, the mode number pair? So which of these modes has longest beta for the same omega? Can you type in the answer? Anyone? It's okay if you if you uh, got a wrong answer. Just just uh, try to participate. Which of the modes is supposed to have the longest beta? At same omega. One, one, Thomas, thanks. Yeah, Isa Young also got one, one, right? The one, one is the correct answer. Why is that? Well, that is because KX and KY becomes minimum, right? At, at mode one, one. So here's the, here's the question then. The similar uh, question, but like 
if you compare uh, mode one, two and mode two, one, which one has longer beta? Can you guess? If you compare mode one, two and mode two, one, which one has longer beta? Is that like, uh, you can say either one, two or two, one, or you can just say they're saying, okay. Okay, so there's a split answer. Park Sang Jun says one, two, Lee Sa Young says two, one. So um, wh what do you think is correct? So, uh, so let's think about, uh, so let's say the length LX, let's say this length is LX and this length is LY, okay? Then uh, if it's a fundamental mode, so K, uh, KX supposed to be a proportional to one over LX and then KY supposed to be proportional to one over LY, right? And of course, also the mode index here mode index mx my so the question is uh, so in this case the first case uh, it's like 1 over lx is kx and then ky is 1 over I mean, it's not actually 1 but anyway it's proportional to one, uh, 2 over ly right and then uh, the the case number 2 is the other way around it's 2 over lx one over ly. And then what we know is uh, ly is larger than lx, which means kx is larger than ky. Okay, so, so, uh, so then uh, what, what do you think is the answer? So if you uh, if you do a uh, simple calculation, like uh, if you do ky squared and K, uh, kx squared, then uh, it becomes uh, lx plus ly squared of four. And then in, in the second case, it's the other way around, right? And because ly, I'm sorry, uh, uh, so kx is larger than ky or, or ly is larger than uh, lx, this supposed to be bigger than this number, right? So that beta is bigger in this case, one, two. Am I? clear or does that require any uh, more uh, explanation? So what's more important is that, uh, you know, um, in order to see like uh, which of the mode has the lowest beta, uh, you need to check, uh, you need to find a, how can I say, least oscillating uh, mode profile. So in this case, you see this oscillation along the uh, X axis is a little too fast so that it's better to have a uh, oscillation uh, a little bit more smooth so that uh, the overall um, summation of K vector becomes smaller. So um, that's basically how you uh, kind of count or uh, sort the mode. So depending on the length of beta, uh, you can say this is the fundamental mode. This is the uh, second order mode, second mode, uh, second lowest. And then you need to compare this and that, right? Which one would be, see if uh, which one has lower uh, uh, beta and so on. So, but anyway, you, you get the point as uh, your mode profile becomes more oscillatory, like if there are more oscillations along X and Y directions, uh, your beta becomes shorter and shorter. And then if it becomes too, too oscillating too much, then 
you can imagine uh, your beta uh, becomes imaginary, right? If these two numbers are too high, then your beta becomes imaginary. That means that's not a propagating mode. It's not a propagating uh, mode. So that that kind of limits uh, the number of supported uh, modes in a waveguide. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, uh, if there is nothing, I'd like to move on to the dielectric waveguide. So uh, we so we go uh, one step further, and then we decided we want to do this dielectric waveguide. Examples of dielectric waveguides are uh, optical fiber or uh, integrated optical waveguides. Just looks like this, and then uh, dielectric waveguides uses total internal reflection as its guiding mechanism. So what happens is that like if you have a high index medium and low index medium, uh, and at the interface, uh, light wave cannot uh, transmit through this low index medium, but they actually total internal uh, undergoes total internal reflection like this, right? So uh, if this angle theta is larger than the critical angle, you have total internal reflection and you can use it as a guiding mechanism. And so uh, it goes uh, this way, just like uh, what we did in uh, PEC waveguide. But there's one difference. One big difference is that if you look at the example of uh, dielectric waveguide, you can see th there is non-zero field outside, right? Outside the material. So you remember uh, in PEC waveguide, electric field was zero in the cladding. But in, in this case, in dielectric waveguide, uh, you are allowed to have uh, some electromagnetic fields. Uh, uh, yeah, so we exist in the cladding machine. So how do you deal with this problem? Well, it's the same. Like you, you can solve the exact same, uh, same uh, system, but with different uh, boundary conditions. So electric field solutions looks the same. And then kappa here also defined like this, right? It's just what I said. And one difference is that uh, in the cladding regime, now, uh, because it's not the PEC waveguide, uh, electric field can still exist. But what we want is the mode uh, that is guided uh, through the core of the waveguide. So outside the core, uh, they should uh, decay exponentially as we move away from the interface. So here's what it uh, says, right? So electric field, in the cladding e to the uh, gamma x, right? And then here uh, gamma. Uh, so uh, if you so so what the biggest difference between uh, like if you compare these two equations, uh, if you make uh, move this term into the left side, then kappa squared plus beta squared is epsilon one omega squared c squared. This is nothing but kg squared kx squared is equal to nk0 squared, right? This equation and that equation is same. And if you look at this equation instead, this equation says uh, uh, if you uh, make this term into that way and then this term into this way, then minus gamma squared plus beta squared is equal to epsilon two omega squared c squared. So the right-hand side is N2, right? N2 K zero squared, and then here K Z squared. And this one is now K 
k is supposed to kx squared, right? So here, uh, there's a big difference. Like in this case, uh, kx is chosen to be imaginary number of uh, uh, gamma. And then because this kx is imaginary, uh, it can uh, exponentially decay as it move away from the interface. So you, re you remember that e to the i k dot r minus omega t. So in order to, for your field to be decay exponentially, uh, your, uh, your k vector should be uh, imaginary. Right, so that imaginary multiplied by imaginary becomes a negative number. So that's why. Uh, um, so in this case here again, your uh, you know uh, k uh, the x directional k vector is an imaginary number. So that's one of the you know, important distinction. Okay, so if you if you have this, and then if you look at the uh, the full Maxwell's equation, like here, the curl of E uh, and then curl of H. And, um, and, then, and then these are the just um, the three components, X and Y and Z components of each equation. And uh, because we know that in this problem, uh, the propagation constant is beta. So round round Z becomes I beta, right? So if you apply that, and also uh, along Y direction, everything is um, have translational symmetry. So we can make Y directional derivative to be zero. And then we apply these two conditions to these equations, we get six reduced equations, right? And then uh, what we do is we can further reduce the equation because we are right now we are only interested in TE wave. Okay. TE wave, as I said, has electric field uh, only have Y components. So if you think about the relevant equations, what are the relevant equations? This equation and this one and this one. Right? So these three equations are relevant to TE wave. And these three equations are relevant for TM wave because you, you, know, you see it involves HY field, only HY field. So you can see that uh, TE equations and TM equations are just separable, right? So right now we are only interested in TE wave. And then another thing that you can also notice is that these one, two, equation one, two, three are a little bit redundant. So all you need is uh, just two of those. So uh, we are going to use just uh, equation one and two. If, if one and two are satisfied, three is automatically satisfied. Okay, now uh, we have all the building blocks. We have uh, the equation form for the electric field, EY field. And then once we have EY field, uh, we can obtain the, the X component of the H field and then Z component of the H field, right? So what we need to satisfy is this. E, e y component. So E y component is continuous at these boundaries. And then H z component, H z component should also be continuous at the boundaries because there's no external field. So these two are the important uh, boundary conditions. And you may wonder why we don't care about H say H x component, for instance you know that hx, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, H, not the hx, uh, bx should be continuous, right? That's another boundary condition we know. And, and can anyone answer why, uh, why we don't care uh, bx in this case? Why hy, I'm sorry, ey and hg 
continuous would be enough to determine uh, all the boundary uh, solutions? Can anyone answer this? Why BX component? Doesn't need to be considered. in this case. Anyone? Okay. Um, so, that is because uh, H, I mean, BX component, this boundary condition is redundant to EY boundary conditions. Like if you look at this equation, okay, you can see uh, if you move mu along here, then BX and EY are just uh proportional right and there's no other uh, material properties uh, involved in the coefficient so if ey is continuous at the boundary then automatically bx becomes continuous right so the condition for EY and condition for BX are just redundant. So we don't need to take care of both, right? Because it's, you know, it's redundant. So now uh, you have two boundary conditions you need to satisfy at the boundary. And you can see here for the uh, symmetric wave, uh, the first condition EY continuous becomes this. And the second condition, HY becomes continuous like that. So how do, we, how do we get this equation? Well, we can just apply uh, here, you have a continuous wave, you have this cosine term in the core, and then uh, in the cladding uh, in this regime, the, your uh, equation have this form so that uh, at the boundary, let's say x equals a, if you uh, plug that in and then equate both side, side, you get this equation, right? e to the minus gamma a, uh, and then uh, e as cosine kappa a. And similarly, uh, if you get z component of the magnetic field, by taking the uh, derivative along x direction and then equate them at the interface, you get this equation. So from these, these two equations, uh, you can obtain this one equation by taking the ratio of these two, okay? And then for anti-symmetric mode, you can do the similar thing and then uh, the equation becomes like that, okay? Now, uh, another equation is uh, obtained, can be obtained from the wave equation. So from the wave equation, as I said, in the uh, core, this is the equation that uh, you need to satisfy. And the, in the cladding, this was the equation that you want to satisfy, right? That involves gamma and epsilon two here. And this is the core, so it's kappa and epsilon one. So if you equate, uh, uh, you know, from these two relations, uh, you can reduce it to this form. Okay, so these are all the building blocks. Now, uh, if you want to solve for symmetric mode, for instance, uh, because you have uh, this here and there. So what you need to satisfy is tangent kappa a is equal to this number. And then if you want to solve for an anti-symmetric mode, you can equate 
minus cotangent kappa a to be equal to this number. So that's how you solve uh, for the mode. So yeah, this is the equation. This is the equation. So the equation itself is a little bit more complicated, right? If you compare this with our previous example of uh, uh, PEC wave, right? It's, it's a bit more complicated, but it's not that much complicated. So how do, uh, there's no uh, analytic solution for this, but uh, you can uh, draw, uh, plot each side of the equation to get some sense how your solution is gonna look like. So if you draw the left-hand side, tangent kappa A, so this is tangent kappa A, right? And also this and that are all tangent kappa A. Tangent kappa A repeats every pi, right? And then minus cotangent kappa A, I use probably orange line. So these are minus cotangent kappa A. So, so these lines are for uh, symmetric mode, and then this line is for uh, anti-symmetric mode, okay? And then uh, if you look at right-hand side, this right-hand side is uh, inversely proportional to kappa, okay? And this is kappa. So inversely proportional to kappa. So these red lines uh, is about this uh, right-hand side equation. And as you increase omega, of course, uh, omega is, so this right-hand side is proportional to omega. So as you increase omega, you basically make your curve to be lifted like this, like in this figure, right? Then the solutions uh, is the intersection of these two uh, plots. So here, in this case, you have only one solution. And then here in this case, you have two solutions, three solutions, four solutions, right? So as you increase the number of, uh, I must say, as you increase the, uh, the frequency, the number of uh, allowed modes increases. And of course it, uh, in, you know, it, the, the fundamental mode, is what uh, 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 is always symmetric mode and then anti-symmetric and then symmetric. So it's back and forth, like going alternatively appears. And then you can also see from this uh, observation, uh, the cutoff frequency of the nth mode. So cutoff happens when this red curve hits this point right, the, the, or this point or that point. When, when the red curve hits the, uh, you know, zero, crest, zero crossing of the blue curve, then the uh, mode cutoff occurs, right? And then if you uh, find the condition for zero crossing, uh, that's like this, right? So uh, kappa ma, so kappa a becomes a, uh, half integer, that's the condition for uh, zero crossing for the blue curve. And then uh, you can plug this in to this equation and then you can find the condition for omega, right? Okay, so you got the uh, mode cutoff. So uh, similar to uh, PEC waveguide, Dielectric waveguides also have mode cutoff, but at a different frequencies, right? And probably, uh, you know, the the overall mechanism and the difference between dielectric waveguide and uh, PEC waveguide is not clear to you at the moment, but uh, it becomes a little more clear uh, in a slide or two. So. One of the uh, interpretation about this dielectric waveguide mode cutoff uh, is related with, of course, uh, the total internal reflection. So uh, as we know, 
the uh, n k zero is the length of the total wave vector. Kappa is the uh, su surface perpendicular k vector. So if you take the ratio, uh, then that's the cosine theta, right? That's the cosine theta. And then, uh, well, k zero is nothing but omega divided by c, and then n is square root of epsilon one. So if you plug that in, it becomes like that. And here uh, we put the cutoff frequency, the, the, the uh, expression for the cutoff frequency. So if you put this relation, the omega m, c kappa divided by square root of epsilon one minus epsilon two. So if you put plug that in into this equation, c kappa canceled out, and then you only have square root of epsilon one minus epsilon two in the numerator, right? So square root of epsilon one minus epsilon two square root of epsilon one. And then, so you, you consider this situation. You have square root of epsilon one, and then you have theta and your cosine theta. So this is uh, square root of epsilon one minus epsilon two. And then this length becomes epsilon two, square root of epsilon two, right? So this is equal to a sine, arc sine of a square, a square root of two over square root of square root one, square root of epsilon one, which is the definition of the critical angle. I'm not sure whether you remember this n one sine theta one is equal to n two sine theta two. And then from this, you can define the critical angle for total internal reflection like this arc sine of uh, n1 and 2 right so what this tells you is that uh, the meaning of the cutoff frequency is actually agrees with the definition of critical angle for total internal reflection so what it says is that at high frequency, so at high frequency, when the total K vector is large enough, so that angle is large enough, uh, total internal reflection happens. But as kappa become, I'm sorry, as, uh, to, uh, as the, the length of the uh, wave vector becomes shorter, your incidence angle becomes smaller, and if it becomes smaller than the tot, uh, critical angle, then now transmission occurs, right? So the total and internal reflection doesn't happen so that you lose your wave as a form of just radiation, right? So now you can see the cutoff mechanism for PEC waveguide and dielectric waveguide are different, right? So uh, if you go back to the PEC waveguide again, uh, as you increase the uh, frequency, I'm sorry, as you decrease the frequency, your total K vector becomes shorter. And then eventually uh, you are reaching this point, zero uh, angle, so that it just cannot propagate. Right, but anyway, it's still uh, uh, confined within the uh, dielectric medium. But here, in this case, it's a little different, right? It's like as your uh, omega decreases, your k vector becomes shorter. But up to a, a, you know, if you go over a certain point, then you lose your wave as a form of radiation, as a form of transmission. Right, because total internal reflection condition uh, is violated. Okay. So now, uh, if you draw the dispersion relation of uh, dielectric waveguides, it looks like this. Okay. 
So uh, these two lines, the first line is the light line for uh, uh, the medium one, the, the core medium, okay, with index N1. And then this line is the uh, light line for uh, medium K2, I mean, medium with N2, so, so, so the cladding medium, okay? So what happens is that, uh, again, as your omega, as your frequency becomes lower and lower, your, uh, again, the angle of incidence uh, basically becomes smaller. And when it hits the uh, dispersion relation of medium two, the core, uh, the cladding, then it's no longer guided, but it leaks out as a form of radiation. And the same thing happens like for all the other modes, okay? So the, if you think of, if you look at the, uh, 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 the phase velocity, they are always in between N1 and N2. I'm sorry, uh, N1, uh, you know, N1 and N2. And then, uh, it, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's one uh, good observation. And then uh, if you compare this with PEC waveguide, PEC waveguide was look like this. Like this, okay? So it only approaches to the light line of the core medium, but because our cladding was PEC, so there's nothing like this. Right, it just hits uh, the zero beta condition, okay, and that determines your mode cutoff. But in this case, in this case, uh, as your mode hits this point total internal reflection, I'm sorry, this, this one is fine. This condition, the total internal reflection um, doesn't happen, so it loses its energy. So it's no longer guided. Okay. So is there any question so far? You can type in uh, the question or you can also uh, also Unmute yourself uh, if you want to ask. Okay, well, I just want you to ask more questions, like more, uh, uh, more, how can I say, involved in the lecture so that you can learn more uh, from this class. But anyway, uh, if you don't have a question right now, uh, let me just move on. Okay, so we can do the similar thing for the dielectric waveguide. So uh, we can confine uh, the dielectric medium into two uh, in both directions, both X and Y directions. And in this case, um, you can have like multiple modes occurs uh, as we, uh, learned earlier uh, in the previous case, and also depending on the uh, the polarization of the mode. And one of the application here uh, of the dielectric waveguide is optical fiber. The most famous uh, application is optical fiber. So optical fiber has a core with high index and a cladding with a uh, low index, and uh, if you look at their radial profile, the, the radial profile of the mode, uh, you can see uh, instead of like uh, having X and Y mode index, in this case, because uh, uh, optical fiber is uh, circular, has circular cross section, you have angular mode index and radial mode index. Radial mode index tells you 
how many times your electromagnetic field oscillates along radial direction. So radial index one, there's no oscillation. Radial index two, like it's going up and down and up and down and up and down like, and so on, right? So as you go to this axis, your wave becomes more oscillatory along uh, radial direction. And if you go to this direction, uh, your wave becomes more oscillatory in uh, uh, the angular direction. So like you see, going up and down and up and down, and then four times, six times, and so on. So um, yeah, so this is uh, one example. And then, and then you probably uh, question uh, like why I draw only a few, like uh, uh, only a few, uh, angular mode index for high radial mode index. But that is because um, if once your core index and the core radius is determined, then uh, the number of uh, guided mode is also determined, right? And as I said earlier, the, how can I say, the, um, the sum of the oscillation should be under certain value in order to be guided. So when your mode is oscillating a lot uh, along radial direction, then this mode cannot be oscillating along angular direction uh, because if it becomes uh, oscillating in both radial and angular direction, then uh, what happens is that uh, basically in our previous example, like, okay, Kx, Ky, Kz should be uh, equal to N1 omega squared C squared. And then uh, again, Kz, uh, we said this is a beta. So beta is N1 squared omega C squared minus Kx squared minus Ky squared, right? So if kx squared plus ky squared becomes too large, then beta becomes imaginary so that it's no longer a guided mode. So uh, the number of allowed modes are determined by this condition. So, and then, and then in this case, it's a little different because it's r and theta, but anyway, the idea is the same. So, if the mode is oscillating a lot along one direction, then probably there's no room for this mode to be oscillating along x direction in order to make maintain your beta to be real, right? So that's the, uh, the reason why you have only a fewer number of uh, angular mode index uh, as your radial mode index increases, right? So this is basically number of the, you know, drawing the supported uh, uh, mode profile for a given uh, core thickness. Okay, so here is a short um, example of uh, what, you know, uh, the, the applications of the waveguide. So, this is an, uh, a waveguide modulator. So if you look at a, uh, this is a sim the simplest example, I would say. So if you look at a uh, index, the rear part of the refractive index and imaginary part of the refractive index of silicon as a function of their uh, carrier density, the elect electron density and hole density, you can see that uh, alpha, the absorption coefficient and n, the rear part of the refractive index actually varies depending on, uh, you know, the, uh, depending on the, the carrier density. So as you, if you change the carrier density of the silicon by applying a bias, either forward or, or, or reverse bias, then uh, the property of your waveguide changes, right? Both, both the index and also the absorption coefficient changes. And by using these conditions, you can uh, basically modulate the guided mode propagating along this waveguide. So that's one application, one like uh, famous application of this waveguide. And 
uh, you can also use another material like uh, um, like in, in this case graphene to modulate uh, the guided mode. So for instance, you have a silicon waveguide here. The, the most of the wave is uh, uh, guided through this silicon, but very nearby, only 10 nanometer above, you have graphene. And then graphene uh, tends to absorb, I mean, the, the absorption properties of graphene uh, changes dramatically depending on their carrier density. So that uh, by applying the voltage between graphene and silicon, you can change the, um, the carrier density of graphene so that you can uh, you know, uh, uh, modulate basically the transmission uh, through a silicon waveguide. And you can see uh, it, it is possible to achieve a, a relatively high uh, frequency oscillation, frequency switching. Okay, and as a final content of this lecture, uh, people also uh, try to use this waveguide structure uh, and uh, for like integrated, photonic integrated circuit. So they create like, uh, just like a uh, electronic integrated circuit, which is composed of uh, electrical lines. Like if you think about the electronic circuit, there's a uh, electrical uh, connection and the register and also the switches and the source of the current. I mean, these components or diodes, I mean, these components, uh, you know, uh, constitute electric circuits. And similarly, people uh, want to create like photonic integrated circuit. And of course the important, um, uh, important building blocks are just optical waveguide. You know, these are the waveguide and the uh, interferometer and beam splitter and so on. And also the source and module, uh, I'm sorry, uh, here's the source, which correspond to the battery of the uh, for the electric circuit and photo detector and modulator, which support, uh, is, uh, is correspond to the switch for the electric circuit and so on. So that uh, they uh, want to have a large scale uh, integrated circuit, photonic integrated circuit on chip and where to use it. Uh, well, you can use it for high, uh, high frequency data transmission. So let me click this video. Um, data is growing at a staggering rate from an ever increasing number of types and sources. In fact, 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years alone. This explosive data growth is placing extraordinary demands on networks with five times more traffic occurring within the data center compared to total internet traffic, requiring large scale data center operators to deploy higher speed connectivity over greater distances, which can be longer than several football fields. To meet these demands, a massive number of high speed optical transceivers are deployed to connect switches, converting electrical data to optical signals that are transmitted on fiber optic cables over distances from hundreds of meters to several kilometers. However, these transceivers are often expensive and traditional optics manufacturers have struggled to keep up with the unprecedented deployment size of hyperscale data centers. But Intel Silicon Photonics has changed the game by integrating optical data transmission with Intel's world-class silicon manufacturing, enabled by the world's only hybrid silicon laser. This breakthrough technology converts silicon-based electrical signals into light, enabling data to be transmitted over great distances at ultra-high bandwidth in today's hyperscale data centers. And with multiple 100 gigabit products shipping in high volume, Intel Silicon Photonics delivers a cost-effective solution for faster connectivity over long distances to maximize hyperscale compute utilization. Intel Silicon Photonics is also expanding beyond the data center with products for 5G wireless connectivity for communication service providers. 
And in the future, Intel silicon photonics products will drive a significant increase in bandwidth and will provide even greater levels of integration with silicon, dramatically increasing system performance with higher density, lower latency, and lower power. Intel silicon photonics, breakthrough network technology for the demands of hyperscale data centers today with compelling innovation for the future. To learn more, visit us here on the web. interesting video right so uh sorry about that yeah so um right so people uh you know have been working on this uh integrated photonic circuit uh just to have a high bandwidth data transmission and also, uh, they also want to kind of uh, integrate this circuit with electrical uh, integrated circuit in order to uh, interface them for the data center uh, purposes. So uh, this is all for today.